What's up, everybody, and welcome to Spectator Mode Podcast, episode 37. This week's a little different because instead of our normal three people podcast, we have four people on the show. We have actually a longtime member who has not been on the show in quite some time. Hello, Carl. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. Being busy, but uh, I'm back. All right. And as always, we have Rob. Rob, what's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, guys? And Diego. Hey, y'all. So this week, there's been a couple of interesting bits and pieces of news out there in the wild. And as you know, we try to address those things that are that we want to talk about. But we always go off the beaten path. So bear with us. We like to have fun and talk about things that, you know, sometimes we may forget and they come back to the forefront. Of course, things we do have planned is Shroud coming over to Mixer and joining Ninja. Bethesda and Fallout first. That doesn't sound very good. And then... There's been a lot of AAA games all of a sudden being delayed until 2020 and beyond. And since we have Carl here, he's going to talk to us about PAX Australia 2019. He had a lot of cool things to do there. He had interviews with people. So, yeah, we're going to pick his brain. As you guys know, very first thing we do is we ask, what games have we been playing? Carl, since you have not been here for a while, you get to start it off, sir. What have you, not, what have you been playing? What have you not been playing? Jeez. What, what have I been playing? Well, if you want to take the PAX uh, stuff into account, then I've been playing things like Minecraft with the nice RTX uh, ray shading edition that comes out in January that looks absolutely amazing. Uh, I did get my hands on the Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which has only just been released at the time of recording. Uh, Luigi's Mansion 3. I think there was a few other games that I... Like to slip my mind at this point in time. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake or the Avengers demo that uh, were both available there. The lines were over three hours long, and I was like, screw that. But as soon as I get home, uh, I've actually been playing something that's going to be popping up in review in a couple of weeks. Uh, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, Tokyo 2020. So keep an eye out for the review on that. And also, I tried to play Borderlands 3 on my nice system that I have here, but NVIDIA, your drivers are shit. Stop crashing my goddamn game. I think you mean the game is shit. Stop blaming NVIDIA. That game runs poorly on everything. (laughs) The game is bad. Yeah, I don't know why. Like I'm running uh, the RTX 2080 Ti, and for some reason, I cannot even like build a character without the entire game freezing up my entire PC. Yeah, just stop playing. So, just stop. It's yeah, not I've, worth I've, it. I've, I've, <laughs> I've stopped. I, I have. I've put my hands up. I've gone stop. I'm done. I'm gonna wait and hopefully see if there's a fix comes out in a couple of weeks. But that's uh, that's down the track there. So but yeah, so that, that's pretty much my my gaming time has been split up between bits and pieces of packs, review stuff, and. Yeah, I haven't really been playing for like pleasure as <laughs> as it would be for the uh, the last couple of weeks because it's all been business, business, business. Now, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure our our PR contact told us that we could talk about Sonic for a little bit. He wants to get some previews out there. So, if you don't mind, what do you think about the game so far? It is enjoyable. Uh, anyone who has played previous. Uh, Sonic and Mario Olympic Games might find this to be very familiar but with the inclusion of the retro stuff uh, it sort of gives it like a fresh 8-bit coat of paint the game really needed uh, Yeah, that's about all I'm really going to say now because like, I'm pretty much done with the review and that's due out on November 5th after the game, the day the game launches so if anybody wants to get full review then you're going to have to come to the website and read the review all right, all right, Rob. All right, well, yeah, I'm still on typical Destiny two. I won't, you know, talk too long about that. Um, just been doing a bunch of Crucible and stuff. Um, I'll tell you what I have been playing though, which just came out today, um, is some Modern Warfare. Um, which I, you know, I can save for later on if we want to talk about it in, in at length because um, I was able to play the campaign for a little bit. Um. And I know we've talked at length about like the beta and multiplayer and everything. So I figured, you know, if we wanted to discuss it either now or later, um, I, I did get uh, about three or four hours into the campaign so far. So I'm pretty much reaching the end, but not exactly finished. Um, so I've been playing that for 
pretty much the majority of the day today, and um, I've been enjoying it. So, yeah. So you've been playing Modern Warfare. All right. You know what? Let's add that to the docket. Another Ooh. topic to talk about. Uh, Diego, sir? So I guess I should save my Modern Warfare talk because I'm level 20 in the multiplayer, and I've completed the Holy campaign. Holy shit. Um, and I have no time with Spec Ops, so I can't really touch on that. But if we're going to do a Modern Warfare dedicated topic, I'll hold off on that because I played other things this week. Yeah, do um, that. I unfortunately have not had that much time to dive into the Outer Worlds, but I've played about an hour to two hours of it, and I really like what I've played. Of course, it's still like the very, very beginning, but like that obsidian quality is is very apparent. It's there from the start. The writing is great. Character builds are in depth. I like all the characters. Um, I think I'm playing on the supernova difficulty, which is like the hardest difficulty. Plus, like you have to eat and drink. You can only save on your ship. Like fast travel is very limited. Uh, it's really, really cool. The gunplay is a lot better than I thought it would be. Like Keith, have you touched this game at all? Yeah, I've, I've only played about two hours of it. Yeah, because like I'm I'm I played a uh, Fallout New Vegas for a while before this game launched, just to like get my Obsidian Fallout kick. And man, the gunplay in the game is not good at all. But in Outer Worlds, it's like surprisingly satisfying and like really punchy. I think uh, there's like depth to it. I'm using cover. There's like a bullet time mechanic that I really like. And if you level up some of your skills, like if you hit a certain body part with bullet time, it'll automatically cripple that part. There's like some surprising like strategy and depth to it. Plus, like your companions, you can you can give them commands to them, kind of like Mass Effect. It kind of feels like Obsidian took like some of the greatest things we've seen in like recent RPGs like that, like Mass Effect and Fallout, and like kind of put them in together in like its own little hodgepodge of a game. I mean, I'm not far enough to like really uh, give a complete opinion on this game, but I like it. It's good. If you're into Outer Worlds, uh, if you've been following it, like you're gonna buy it anyway. If you like RPGs, give it a shot. Also, it's on Game Pass. So that's cool. Were you playing it on a PC or uh, Xbox One? So I played it on an Xbox One X uh, because it unlocked like a full 12 hours earlier. And then I swapped to PC like earlier today. I like it a lot better on PC. Dude, were you using the keyboard and mouse or a controller? Keyboard and mouse. Okay. Um, I haven't <laughs> been hitting any like performance issues or anything. I know some people have been running into like some crashes, some stutters, things like that. But like I am totally fine on my machine i don't know what's going on with that game though because you know sometimes with city and launches on pc you can be kind of a little buggy but that's that uh, i've also played another game this week that i streamed on my mixer channel mixer.com slash diego live for all you curious people out there uh moons of madness oh yeah yeah i yeah, heard yeah. about this game at, at e3 and it's like a lovecraftian cosmic horror game set in space which sounds right up my alley so I hopped in this game on my stream and I played about an hour to two hours on stream and then I played a little bit more off camera. Um, I really like this game. It starts off really slow, almost to a fault. It's a lot of just kind of walking around and doing pretty basic puzzle solving while people kind of talk in your ear, you know? But like once the once the horror part gets going, it's really good. Um, I, one thing I really have to point out this game is, is like the visual design and the imagery. Like the lighting is spectacular and like, there's a really cool bit I like in the beginning. There's like it's, it gives me like Resident Evil 2 vibes, like the ending of Resident Evil 2, because there's like these like plant hybrid monsters. It's so cool. And I really think, especially at this time of year, if you're looking for a good horror game, you should definitely check out Moons of Madness. It's like Alien Isolation kind of. Um, there's less combat because on Alien, you can't kill the Xenomorph in Alien Isolation, you know, but like there there are weapons in that game, and like combat is like a viable strategy to like get it off you for a couple seconds. But in Moons of Madness, it's more of like it's almost like a horror themed puzzle game almost, you know? It's not like the horror is definitely there, but it's more it's not like a like a jump scare in your face kind of horror. It's more like just an atmosphere kind of thing. Unfortunately, when I was streaming that game, it it crashed like an hour in and then it crashed my entire stream too. So I don't know if that's like the game because I didn't run any, any I didn't run into any other bugs other than that. So it might have just been poor timing, really really unfortunate timing, but that's a good game. I think it's only on PC right now. It's coming to consoles, I think, early next year, like January. Um, I don't know, like pricing wise, how much it is. I think it's like twenty or thirty bucks. But yeah, I, I highly recommend this game if you're looking for horror. All right, all right, definitely give that a shot too. And as for myself, obviously, Destiny Two still doing the grinds. I I, I get to a point where I'm done with the game, and then I go back with the game and I play an hour or two of PvP, and then I go grind out some more quests. So Destiny Two is always going to be a mainstay. I have played about a good two hours of the Outer Worlds, and I've never played any fall games. I've always watched them from afar. My son plays them a lot, so I watch him play them. And I gotta say, I'm really enjoying it. I did play it on the PC. I started off on my other PC because I wanted to get some 4K footage, and I did encounter two crashes, 
and I restarted the PC. Then it was fine after that. I did run into some performance issues, but I was running at 4K and cranking it the highest it can go. So it, it does have uh, some optimization issues if you're trying to get the highest uh, visual quality from it. But other than that, when I dropped it down some, some of the settings, it ran just fine. And I do like the dialogue, some of the, some of the options you have. Like when you first get on and you take uh, the, what is his name, Hawthorne Hoth ship, and you're talking to the AI, and the AI goes like it's going to try to blow itself up or suck you out of the ship. And it's like, you realize you're on the ground, right? It's just some of the, the tongue-in-cheek humor is actually really fun. That said, I accidentally did kill two of the guards before I made my way into the town. They weren't too happy about that, and everybody tried to kill me on sight. <laughs> but uh, other than that, yeah, the game is actually really interesting. I I'm going to play it through. I'm not playing on the hardest setting because, again, I've never played any of the Fall games, so I wasn't really sure what to expect. But, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying the game so far. I'm definitely enjoying the game. I, I really uh, love how like skill checks are at the forefront of that game. Like, yeah, yeah. Like in in Fallout, you'll come across like intelligence skill checks, or, like persuade skill checks. But in the Outer Worlds, like pretty much all of your options are skill based, and I think that's really cool. It reminds me a lot of Disco Elysium, which is another game I've been playing a lot. But I talked about that show last week, oh, that game last week. I also like the fact with the skill checks there, it, it gives you the bonus. So it's, you have a bunch of different options, then you have the ability to use one of the skill checks. So I like that. I really like that a lot. It gives me a freedom. Um, other than that, it is October. Obviously, we're getting closer to Halloween, so I haven't done it yet, but I'm looking at a couple games I'm going to possibly stream. And isolation being one of them, Dead Space 2, Resident Evil, to, you know, the mainstays, because it is scary, spooky time. But other than that, that's all I've been playing this week. All right, folks, so Mixer got another one. About a month ago, they picked, was it a month or maybe longer? I, I don't remember when Ninja exactly. Was in August. So August, okay. We're about so, two months out. So Mixer picked up Ninja. Obviously, for his celebrity status, but they recently picked up Shroud, who was somebody we talked about previously because we said he was one of, he is or was one of Twitch's biggest streamers. You know, sure, Ninja has the celebrity status, but Shroud is known for being really good at his games, having a really good uh, stream, very relatable, can talk to the people. He's, he's, he's good. He's awesome. Yeah, I think he was the most subscribed on Twitch, not necessarily the most followed, or he was up there. He was definitely up there. And now he's on Mixer. Two days ago, he just he said he was going to Mixer, and he's at Mixer now. And obviously, the the question is once again, what exactly is that going to do for Mixer? And I'm pretty sure the consensus here is it's not really going to do much. I, I, am I in agreement here, or am I wrong here? I think it'll do things just not the way people are thinking, because it's not going to bring in viewers if that's what people are thinking here. It's not going to bring in this mass exodus of viewers from Twitch, but it will bring in streamers. I think. I think. Every every big name you get on on Mixer legitimizes the platform because when Ninja came, we didn't necessarily get in because you can go look at like Streamlabs they do a a quarterly report of like streaming stats for all the big sites. Um, there weren't there wasn't really an increase in um, viewers on Mixer, but like there was a huge influx of people streaming to the platform, and I feel like they're only going to get a few of these big names just to like legitimize the platform and get people to start building their own uh, Mixer channels because this this platform's still like super new. Um, and then in a few years' time, we'll have these, like, names that are big, but not necessarily on, like, Twitch big name levels, because Twitch is, like, huge. Twitch is ginormous. But, like, Mixer is, like, fa facilitating their own partners, you know? Like, they have their partner list right now. And they're nowhere near Twitch yet, but, like, people are going to come, and then these these channels are going to grow naturally on, on Mixer, I think. And I don't yeah. think Shroud's the last one, either. I think we're going to get these oh, no. on a semi-regular basis. Yeah, I don't think he's the last one, because remember I said that they also picked up, they didn't really make a big deal about it. They picked up somebody from Facebook Gaming, but I don't think Shroud is going to be the last one from Twitch. I doubt it. But the question I have now is, do you think Microsoft or Mixer is being selective on who they bring over, or is it just a game of, we have the money, let's bring over whoever we can to get more people onto our platform? And I'm really worried about that, because I'm going to be honest here, there are some assholes on Twitch I don't want to see over on Mixer. Well, Mixer has like a very, very, they're very strict about their like positivity um, thing, you know? They, well, that's they my want, problem. They a different vibe than Twitch. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I hope they stick to that. I don't want them to get to the point where like, you know what? We don't care anymore. We just want people over here. Because power corrupts. And I don't want to see that happening. I think they have a really good thing over here with uh, the, um, the less toxicity over here yeah, i don't I, and i think like when it comes to like big twitch names there are enough to choose from that have the numbers that aren't as toxic as someone like say dr disrespect for example exactly like, they, they can choose like they 
there twitch isn't exactly hurting for big names like mixer has has the whichever one they want pretty much because they have the microsoft money to throw around if they were to bring over somebody else anybody you could think of top of your head and would they come um honestly i thought about this i was thinking because there's going to be more i think either pokimane or summit 1g is up next and i'm really? calling that right now like summit check me out really? in like two months yeah huh that's I would a... say I would say Doc, but like I think they've already asked Doc because like there's some clips of him going around where it might just be him um, doing his character and doing his personality. But he said like he's strongly hinted at and like outright said they asked him. He was one of the first ones they asked, and he said no. But he's also a very toxic. Uh, that's the yeah. thing. But he's so... also bit very anti mixer publicly. So yeah, well anybody says that to get Pokemon the bank account up, like next. I think she's the next one. What about some of the smaller streamers that are all well known over there, like Cole Carnage and um, Tim the Tatman? I think they should get a bunch of small streamers at once. That way, they get more viewers. Like, because when you just bring over Shroud Ninja, like you bring their audience, but like, it's not worth it when you could bring over like ten medium sized streamers. You know. And that was the thing that I was having the conversation on Reset Editor, and that came up, and that people didn't agree with. And I think they should actually go for maybe some of the smaller streamers. They don't have the biggest subscription base, but they're well-known, they're good people, they put out quality streams, and I think there's some merit in getting people that are lower down the totem pole. I think they're absolutely worth bringing over. Yeah, the thing is just, like, Mixer has that right now, because, like, Mixer's top partners are about that level. They're yeah. about mid-level Twitch streamers. So I think I think what they're trying to do is, like, they're bringing in these big names to, one, legitimize the platform, and they're hoping that these, these Twitch viewers that come over to watch Ninja and Shroud, whenever Ninja and Shroud are offline, they'll see... Because Mixer, right in right before the Shroud announcement, they used to have Hype Zone front and center on their uh, oh yeah that's on their homepage. Which if you guys don't know about Mixer Hype Zone, it's like it auto hosts channels that are in like the top ten of battle royale games. That's gone now. Now they have Partner Spotlight, which shows their most prominent partners. So I think what they're trying to do is like bring in the the Twitch people who watch Ninja Shroud and whoever else they bring next, and then they're when they're offline, they'll see the partners featured front and center, and they'll click on there, and they're trying to develop their own partners with that same audience. The problem I have with the hype zone being gone is I never agree with it in the first place, but smaller people were able to get their, their yeah, time on I it. I love the hype zone because it's, it's now it's gone. Same with up and coming, which is still there. Like Mixer is a great platform for smaller streamers. Like it's it's great for discoverability. And I feel like hype zone needs to come back. Yeah, it definitely needs to come back. It needs to be tweaked, but it needs to come back. Uh Rob, Mace, you guys have been pretty quiet. I know you guys have some opinions on this one. Yeah, well <laughs> I mean Honestly, like I, to some extent, like the idea that they're grabbing some of the bigger names and bringing them over. Um, I mean, they can certainly do that. It's good for, like you said, legitimizing and stuff. I don't know necessarily what the impact would be if they were to get medium sized streamers. Like if they were to create like a highlight reel of people you might know and love on Twitch coming to Mixer. Um, I don't know if it would necessarily have a similar level of impact that the higher streamers would get. Cause it's just kind of like, if you're not part of their niche circle community or whatever, like if you pick up, like say for example, um, Kuru, uh, Kuru HS, he's the, he's like a, a speed runner of, of need for speed games. And you pull him over to mixer, like only the fans from his like chat are going to come over. Um, it's not really going to encourage like maybe other speed runners to come over. Cause it's just, it, it's, it's kind of like you pick out this niche era area and they, they decide to come over and like, they're there for him. They're not necessarily there for other streamers who are on mixer necessarily, or, you know, they might at one point be inclined to take a look around mixer if they want to. But it's like, I feel like if you grab like some of those like lower level streamers and stuff, they're just going to follow their community member wherever they want to wherever they want to follow them and they're going to watch them i don't know necessarily if it's going to create like this wave of people who follow their favorite streamer but then all of a sudden they're like ah oh, mixer's kind of cool i like some of the other people on this platform you know i just feel like it's just gonna f f not necessarily force but just make it so that people who watch somebody on twitch if they hop onto mixer they're just gonna watch them on mixer i, I, I don't see like a huge impact at least on the lower level of streamers, if they're just going to all of a sudden decide, eh, you know, I like uh, my favorite streamer on, on Mixer. Maybe I'll check around and see if there's anybody else who I'm, who I want to watch. Like, you know, they're just going to like look for them regardless. If they want to see a, a certain other streamer, they'll look for them regardless. I, I, to me, it's not like going to be, 
I prefer to watch somebody on Mixer. It's just going to be, I'm going to look for somebody who I enjoy watching. And then all of a sudden, if they find out that they're on Mixer, then they'll go to Mixer. If they're still on Twitch, then they'll just go to Twitch. I, I don't see this being as super impactful um, for even lower level streamers to just, you know, bring more people to the platform. It's just going to be kind of like a a forced moving, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I think Mixer needs a bunch of those small niche creators because Mixer is severely lacking in variety content. If you don't stream Fortnite, Battle Royale games, or, well, that's pretty much it. Um, nobody watches it on Mixer. Like, it, yeah. the drop-off is, like, from however many thousand, because Ninja or Shroud is streaming, to, like, 1,000, to, like, less than 100. Like, it, it Mixer needs these small uh, to medium-sized streamers just to pad the numbers out. Because, like, if I want to go watch, like, a game that maybe has 1,000 viewers on Twitch that's not as big but still has a following, like, it, that... That like Dota, non-existent on Mixer. CS:GO, not yeah. happening. Like, and those are big <laughs> streaming games, mostly because they're esports scenes. But like, those things, those games don't exist on Mixer, and like, they need to bring over those streamers next. I feel, and I feel yeah. like Ninja, they covered their Fortnite bases. Shroud, he still mainly plays BRs and FPSs, but like, that's still more variety. But now I feel like they need a dedicated variety streamer, just to get games up there that aren't normally in the top ten. Like, they need, they're in drastic need of variety on their platform. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, and I'm in there with you right there because I stream a bunch of games that aren't top games and you barely get any Nobody viewers. Watches. Yeah. And like, if I go over to Twitch, like one of my older mainstays was Dark Souls 3. There's still a big following for Dark Souls players over on Twitch. You come over here, there's nothing. Yeah, like there's nothing. Mixer right now, look at the... Like if I pull up Rainbow Six Siege, that's a popular game on Twitch. Right now, as, we, as we're recording this, there are 300 people watching Rainbow Six Siege. On the entire platform, there's That's only 1,900 watching the Outer Worlds. There are 100 people watching Borderlands 3. Like it's it's pitiful how far these how how um far these drop offs are. Because you have and Modern Warfare right now with 37,000, it's Shroud. It's Shroud, Fortnite yeah, with 4,000. Then Mixer also has a huge problem with 24 seven streams that just farm sparks. But that's a whole nother discussion. Yep, this music yep. is the top three, and like Forza is just all AFK streams. It's they need new content. They they do only five games that succeed on Mixer. Really, it's they need more. I wouldn't even say it's five because some of those other ones are also 24 channels. So, yeah, that's a and then you got the people that are 24 channels and just switch their game name and it's not really the game. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely yeah. a problem. I mean, I'd... Go ahead. I'm, I'm all for like variety and stuff, but I just I don't, I don't know how impactful it would be if they were just going to bring up like a few um, streamers from Twitch over over to Mixer. Like how much is that going to increase their variety? Because like. I don't know if you bring a few variety streamers over, like the next big game that comes out, everybody will start watching that, but then that'll drop off. And then, I mean, the, it, it just kind of goes back to their following. I think Mixer the just needs people who stream watch. those big games. Cause even now on Mixer, like when Outer Worlds was like when that game launched uh, last night, it wasn't even in the top five. It like, they need people to stream these games. Cause like Ninja won't leave Fortnite. He's just not going to do it unless it's like COD because he's a COD partner. Oh, he'll be yeah. there when Halo comes. He'll go to Halo. Yeah. Especially cause he's on Mixer now and he's a Microsoft boy for sure. He's going to be there when Halo yeah. drops. But, like, they need people to stream games that are not Battle Royale games or, like, certain shooters. Yeah. Just so even if, like, maybe their Twitch audience won't necessarily follow, but, like, new Mixer viewers. So the platform won't look dead to them. Because when you log on to Mixer right now, it looks sad. It looks, It's, it's yeah. depressing to be on Mixer. Nobody, yeah. nobody watches anything that's not, like, five games. Yeah, and it's a damn shame because they have a lot to offer, as we said. But, yeah, the problem is they just need a little more padding because, like, Twitch is padded out by everybody who's streaming for, like, one or two viewers. Like, it's they really pad out some categories because there's thousands of people streaming. They just yeah. need an influx of streamers that can grow some communities, which takes time. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's, what and that's the thing. These, that's what bringing big boys like Shroud does. It legitimizes the platform. And I th it, just like we saw with Ninja, we're going to see an influx of new streamers. And hopefully. I think Mixer needs to, one, launch on PS4, which hopefully will not be a problem when the PS5 rolls around. And two, it needs to get rid of its uh, reputation as um, the LFG platform. Because, like, when I stream on Mixer, it's a lot of, one, it's a young kid platform. It's, like, kids that are less than 10 come into my streams, and they ask if they can play with me. Like, that's not a good combo. Like, uh, I think Mixer demographic is, like, a good 10 years younger than Twitch's. And it's, they always want to play. And if you say no, they leave. You know, they just leave your channel. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Mixer needs to get past that, uh, that preconception before they can uh, start really growing as a streaming platform, I think. Because it's right. a joke. It's a joke in the Twitch circles. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I won't I won't let us kick that horse anymore. So we'll just... I love Mixer, we'll, though. I do. I do, too. It, it makes me sad. It's like a love-hate relationship where why are you abusing me so much, but I love you. I can't leave you. Yeah, such a bad thing. 
Mace has been really quiet. Oh, you saying something? What were you gonna say? Well, so like going back to like what they need to look at, like we covered a lot of what they need to look at. I think rather than going after individuals, they need to start working on events. Go talk to Blizzard. Say to Blizzard, look, we want to get exclusive rights to do the uh, the free streaming for BlizzCon. Okay, well, to stop you real quick, they did something like that. They they did, and then they fell off. I don't know what happened with that. I think they were doing it in general and just needs a bigger esports presence because that draws a lot of viewers to Twitch too. But they had yeah, that. Exactly, they tried to. Exactly. Like they need they need to work with events. Like this is the thing. It's like it's one thing to have big name streamers, but big name streamers only do so much. They, like if they really want to go all in, go all in on Fortnite, and say to Epic, look, we want your your next big five tournaments or something to be exclusively streamed through Mixer on a Mixer channel, not rebroadcast through Twitch. Give them like some sort of exclusivity. You know, uh, go talk to to Riot and say we want uh, the League of Legends World Tournament or something. Go to World, go to you know World of Warcraft. Go to Blizzard. Say, look, we want the BlizzCon free streams. Throw money at the company to bring their stuff exclusively to Mixer. Yeah, especially with Mixer's like FTL sub second delay on streams. Live events are like they're really ignoring live events when they should be doubling down on them. Yeah, yeah. I I think the problem with Mixer though is. And it's how it's being ran. Because even though we keep hearing that Microsoft is off, doesn't really touch it, it doesn't do their own thing. I think maybe they need some leadership, some guidance on what they should do. Because you both make valid points. They should be getting more involved with the events. Now, they do weekly or monthly Forza events. And they used to do a lot of gears for... Uh, I think they did yeah, a Dota once upon a time. And then, again, they just but, but this, stopped. But that's, that's the other thing that they need to also get off. And this is what annoys the crap out of me. Like, as Diego was saying, you know, they need to launch it on PS4 because at the moment they're seen as the Microsoft streaming service. I, I've been saying that for yeah, since day one. of those streams are no face cam, no overlay. They just press share button on their Xbox and they're live. Yep, yep. yep. And like I said, I when I first talked to a couple of the Mixer streamers when I went to E3 2017, I was 2017, they said they want to get on PS4, but it's not in it's their hands. Sony. Yeah, yeah, it's all Sony, so... There's nothing they can but do if Sony changed their mind. But one other thing they might want to start looking at is besides getting just people who stream on Twitch, they might look at people who do cross-platform stuff. Like, I'm, I'm jumping in just having a look around on Twitch at the moment. Like, if they want the next big one, grab, uh, grab Summit. Summit's your next biggest guy, and at that point, they pretty much crippled the FPS area. Yeah, and on, Summit plays a lot of other stuff, too, that Twitch. really helped their variety. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like I'm looking on here, and yeah, he's not in the, he's like in the top ten. But uh, the Angry Joe Show, no, Dude's a variety. He, he's a variety streamer. He cross platforms on YouTube. He has a dedicated community, like an extremely loyal and dedicated community who will come with him if he moves to Mixer. But the thing is, he's already working with Twitch. So you need to start looking at people who do cross-platform stuff, who have built a real strong community, and work with them. Go talk to, again, I know I'm going to use a World of Warcraft example, go talk to the guild method. Say to their guys, hey, you guys as a guild, we will sponsor you for all your BlizzCon events, your raids and everything. Just bring them over the mixer. I will say this, if they, they approach anybody... They got to be willing to open up that wallet, that pocketbook, whatever you want to call it, because oh, yeah, they're going to they, they, look at the viewership up. and they're going to go, you need to make it worth for a while. Well, yeah, they, they're paying people a lot. They have Microsoft backing them. So, like, obviously, they're going to they're going to I don't even want to know how much they paid Ninja and Shroud. It's got to it's up there a couple million. Yeah. But here's the thing. When is it going to get to the point where they're like, you know, what, we're showing all this money and it ain't working. It's going to come to that I, point. It, it, it will, and it, I can guarantee you it'll probably be about six months. Um, if these guys aren't producing the same type of numbers that they're producing on Twitch within six months... Oh, they're not going to. They're going to they, they, they're gonna turn around and they're going to say, okay, now we're going to drop your contracts. We're going to drop your money. 
Well, they're not, they can't drop the money. I they wonder got how contracts. long they, they've signed these two for, like, because that's not public, right? We don't know how long yeah, it's for. They, they have not said they're not. They have not because said, on but, Mixer they're going to get like maybe a tenth of what they got on Twitch. It's just, that's just how it works. Somebody asked Shroud today. I was watching his stream. No, it was last night actually, and he was trying to get on Call of Duty, but it wasn't working. And he asked him how long you're going to be on Mixer. He said, "I'm here for life." So Ooh. take it as you want, or take it as you may. Who knows? Yeah, nothing. They could also Mixer can also sign like organizations. Like they could just go to TSM and offer them a bunch of money, and they get every TSM streamer on Mixer. That'd be a huge thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to keep talking about this, but yeah, they they need to do something to get their viewership up. And once the viewership comes, then it'll be better. But right now, there's not enough viewers checking out the streamers, and Twitch has it. And the, get Twitch and, been there forever. The other, and the other th- and the other thing is like just to put a last last little thing on it. You're working on a known brand situation. Think about it this way. We've had YouTube gaming streaming before that didn't exactly work out because YouTube is just a video platform. They're not known for streaming. Twitch is known if you want streaming games or a streaming content, you go to Twitch. It's it's like, you know... Um, Bandages are known by the brand Band Aid. We all call them Band Aid. I buy my generic that, ones because that's because that, yeah. But at the same time, you'll find that you often call them Band Aids. Oh yeah, it's like anything. Yeah, we because, call them Band Aids because the, because the brand name sticks is embedded in our head. Yep. So when you think streaming, you think Twitch. You think uh, one-time videos. You go to YouTube. That's why these other services have a hard time sort of breaking that stranglehold. Is because whoever gets in first gets ingrained in the public's mind, and I think that's the biggest one of the biggest problems that anybody's going to have with these type of services is that you need to break that that brand out of people's mind and go, okay, they're just a streaming alternative. And for streaming, we have Mixer, we have Twitch, we have YouTube streaming. Cool, okay, uh, Amazon, whatever's you know, but people are still going. I want to watch gaming. I'm going to go to Twitch. That's the biggest problem that Mixer is going to have is breaking that mentality. And I think Mixer will be fine. You, the only way you're going to break that mentality <clears throat> is to do pretty much everything that we've suggested so far. You and need more. to throw everything at the kitchen sink. And then after, once you finish doing that, go back and do it again. Yeah. Yep. And then, grab, grab, grab the pot of pasta, throw it at the wall, see what sticks. Yeah. I just think we need to see these these streamer deals happen more frequently because like one every two to three months is not enough. That's you're killing your momentum. We need to see one yeah. a month, like at least. I agree, and I mean we've seen kind of like a I guess similar example with when uh, the Epic Game Store came out. I mean everybody was like, oh, why does this exist? And then they started you know buying exclusivity. Like it, it's kind of a similar idea. They're just kind of taking away you know, everything from Steam just by making it exclusive to their platform. Uh, it's kind of a similar situation. You know, you take your favorite stream from Twitch, put them on Mixer, and then all of a sudden, oh, there's so much more people coming to Mixer now because they have to watch their favorite streamer. It's a similar concept. And I mean, it kind of worked. And one last thing before we go. I th- also think that they need to... Um, what's the word looking for? They need to... Um... God, I was going to, I'm trying to get the correct word out there. They need to incentivize the small streamers to stay on Mixer and not get discouraged. I think Twitch has a great thing with the affiliate program. They're adding that though. That's rolling out this fall, like they, soon. That needs to come out now. That yeah, needs to come out now. I, I've applied for it on my channel. You tell you can like, they, they're not calling it affiliate, which they need to be calling it that or, or something like that. But the Mixer streamer progression program will let you yeah, monetize your I streamer. I signed up for like when it first, when they first announced it and I'm just saying like, where's the information? They're they're re- they're being very quiet right now. Yeah, but they had, did say before the end of the year, so hopefully that'll that'll roll out soon. Because Twitch affiliate stuff is still pretty recent too. That's only like two or three years old at this point, right? Yeah, but people were like, "I can't make a partner. I'm going to bust my ass to get the affiliate." Yeah, right now, right now on on Mixer, you're either partnered or you're not. That's how it is. You can't yep. monetize your stream unless you're a Mixer partner. Yep. That's that's going to change very very soon. And that might change. That might change the game. Well, the affiliate I, that's program the thing stopping me from like really really going down and doubling down on mixer because like i can't monetize unless i'm a partner that's that's a that's way too big of a milestone you know i need stepping stones you know mixer academy is a good a good start but that's just a bunch of instruction manuals you you need an achievement system you need an affiliate program and basic things like that you know you need to be able to clip if you're not a partner because clip is a partner privilege on mixer right now. oh my god don't get me started on that (sighs) yeah what were you going to say mace before we jump off here 
I was going to say one last thing they could try if they really want to get desperate. Uh, work with third-party companies and buy exclusive rights to streaming for the game. No, no. Oh, that's bad PR. That. That's no, bad PR right there. Don't do that. Don't. If you hear this, Mixer, don't do that. Don't do that. Please don't do that. I don't know. That's... It might work, though. They get, no. Like, the next year's Call of Duty you can only watch on Mixer. Oh, my God. Don't Microsoft do that. Microsoft first-party titles only streamable on Mixer. You know, anytime Microsoft does anything that can be perceived as negative, they're the bad guy. You know this. Yeah. We don't if want to do that. I don't you recommend know, this. You know what? You know what? <laughs> heels make money, motherfucker. Okay? Heels uh... make money. If you're going to heal it, heal it up. Make that money. All right. All right. All right. You know what? You want to talk about heels. Let's talk about Bethesda. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here we Good go. Segue. Yeah, I thought about that. Thank you for that one. So Bethesda wants you to pay money for their broken, busted, piece of crap Fallout 76 to add private worlds or private servers. I have the full list if you want me to go it's through a, it. Yeah, go for it. it. It's a bunch of bull crap. So oh, my God. Primarily, this is to give you private worlds so you can play Fallout 76 with your friends or by yourself. This also gives you a scrap box with unlimited uh, storage space for your crafting materials, mm. which is kind of pay to win in a survival game. Uh, also, a survival tent that essentially, essentially acts as a second home base. That's a free fast travel point and comes with a sleeping bag. A <laughs> oh, stash boy. that gives you access to your entire inventory, including things that are stored. And crafting materials and crafting benches. Uh, you get sixteen. Uh, you get 1,650 atoms every month, which is about $15 of uh, in-game currency. You get the Ranger armor outfit from Fallout New Vegas, which is one of the coolest Fallout outfits of all time, but it's locked behind the description. And then you get emotes. For thirteen dollars a month or a hundred dollars a year, Fallout first. You know what I could do with that money? I could buy an Xbox Game Pass subscription. I could buy a PlayStation Now subscription. I could buy me some food. I can buy a couple games that are better than this piece of shit. It's like that Mario Kart subscription that came out when when Mario Kart Tour launched. Like I'm kind of insulted. Yeah. Like how do you come out with the, like something that offers me so little, charge me so much in a in a post Game Pass world? Yeah. Okay. You you want to you want to hear something funny with with Fallout seventy six? When I went and bought uh, my Xbox One uh, a couple of months ago, it actually came with Fallout 76. Did I went you burn to it? it back. No, I went to trade it back to try and get some money for it. They're like, no, we're not taking it. <laughs> so, because yeah, I, I, had, I had that many secondhand copies and first, hand, like, brand new shipments that it was like, yeah, we don't even want this. That's why we put it in the bundle for free. It's like, no, I don't want <laughs> to play this trade for a copy of, You should have traded for a copy of Anthem. I can't say I'm surprised. I, I but they probably give it back to you for do free. That. <laughs> the thing I with his membership, do that. they wouldn't let me even trade it back in for a copy of anything. They Sounds like a bum deal. It's your it. problem now. <laughs> Literally, that's what it was. Did you see the comic? Somebody wrote a comic that uh, somebody broke into somebody's car and put a copy of Fall Seventy Six in their car. <laughs> uh. <laughs> like what? Why? Why would you do this? But yeah, this is a bad look. For well, the thing with the sub is like it's actually a good value for the money because you're paying like thirteen a month and you're getting more than that in the atoms that the in-game currency that you get, and then you get all these other benefits. But the problem with that is that you have to play Fallout seventy six to make yeah. any use of it. So I guess yeah. it cancels out. Yeah, also, none of this stuff thing. works, by the way. I don't know if you've seen the bug. That was the biggest problem I got with this news was finding out that private worlds didn't work. That yeah, some so people like, some literally had people worlds, invading like, them. They have. <laughs> looted enemies and dead NPCs. Some other private worlds just have public players in them. Also, even if they do work, if you're, someone on your friends list sees you're online playing in a private world, they can just join on you. You can't turn that off. So they're not so really private. They're not private. They're just friend worlds. That's also, stupid. the scrap boxes that have unlimited storing space for all your uh, crafting uh, components, yeah, people are putting their stuff in there and it's just not coming back out. It's disappearing. It's so eating <laughs> crafting materials like the ticket machine at Chuck E. Cheese. Like They're not yeah. coming back out. It's wasted. If uh, only they were targeting their main issue was fixing the video game, that would be like a revolutionary idea. I, you I know just I, love how this news came after they delayed their their wasteland <laughs> NPC. Like, how do you delay NPCs? Like, you guys have only done this like three times before. How do you, games. How do you delay NPCs in 2020? It just blows my mind. Not even that. How do you delay an expansion and then implement a system for subscription where you have to pay I, oh money my. to play the game that you already play? Like, You know what? I got to say this, and I'm sorry. If anybody picks up this subscription pass, you are stupid as hell. You are enabling this company to keep robbing you blind, giving you a broken, busted game, and you don't care. Now, really? to be fair, five people out there are in love with Fallout 76. This game Did is you a say very, five? Yeah. 
this game is a very dedicated community of like a few people <laughs> and I'm not going to rob them of their joy, all right? You guys can play what you want to play. There's people out there playing Anthem still. I just think it's a terrible value. I think Anthem's great if you want to do the flying sensation. That's yeah, great. Yeah, I think Anthem's great for the campaign. That's about it. For the record, uh, Fallout 76 on Twitch has 232 viewers right now. How much you want to bet as on Mixer? Oh, I'm gonna go with no. <laughs> uh, sub 20. Ooh. Fallout 76 currently has 21 viewers on Mixer. Oh, I was so close. That's not wow. bad. Top stream is four viewers. <laughs> private server adventures. That doesn't look very private to me in the preview. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, Fallout. No, oh, damn. Fallout. Said, there's not much to say about this. It's just bad. I think this we is all terrible. It's just the worst. It's like, why would you do this? I just think it's funny how they do this, and well, like none of the stuff they're selling works. There, there is worse. There is worse. Uh, I found, found an article just to sidetrack. Found a uh, a video the other day of the call of duty uh mobile game oh no having the, this this wheel thing that you can uh you spin for in-game currency or not uh for the currency that you buy sorry and it's like in order to get the good stuff you have to spend like nearly 125 dollars to 145 dollars in in-game currency that doesn't sound very good that's a mobile no, game no it's not yeah but even even so it's like that's still Shit pretty like bad that for a mobile game. fucking wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone here ever played uh, Call of Duty Mobile? Yeah. That game is ridiculously easy. Very I, I don't know if I'm playing with bots or like six-year-olds. Or, or both. both. Honestly, <laughs> both. I, I played it for a bit and I was like, wow, I can just really stand and point and shoot and it just works. And I mean, it is a mobile game, so. I mean, it's cute yeah. that they put it on there. And it's fun if you really need to just waste time and you're away from everything. <laughs> like, it works. Yeah. Hey, I hey, I actually have fun with the uh, the Mario Kart game that everybody seems to be pissed off. You about. know, my daughter keeps playing it, and I hear her raging, and I'm like, "Holy shit, is it really that bad?" It's not. You just know, need to know how to play Mario Kart and drift. A lot of people lot. don't know how to play Mario Kart. You would be surprised. Because I've I've met some people who are like, oh yeah, I'm so good at Mario Kart, I'll 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 beat you any day, and then they can't even drift. They play on 50 CC and come in like seventh. Oh, I don't know. know. I, I jump I jump straight in that game. Did drifting and like because because they give you two control styles. You got uh sort of more manual style, which allows you to drift easier, or there's like an automatic one, which pretty much does everything for you. All you gotta do is hold the screen down or some shit. And I'm like, nah, screw that. Give me the advanced controls. I'll work them out on my own. And I'm going to go straight in 150 cc's. It's like, screw that. I'm going straight to the top. And and I'm winning most <laughs> times. I get, like, within top three most races. Is it against bots, though? Is it not, like, true multiplayer yet? It, it It's not true multiplayer. They do just take names and run bots. But even then, it's a Mario Kart game. There's rubber banding like a motherfucker. Yeah. All right, all right. So we all can agree this is a very bad look for Bethesda. Yeah, it gets it's worse bit. and worse. Like you would think after launch, after this horrible, horrible launch, one of the worst launches of all time, they would just lay low. But then the bag thing happened. Then the helmet tested positive for like asbestos, and now we we have this. Like, just go make Elder Scrolls Six. Just Todd Howard, go back in your hole, <laughs> hibernate for like five years. Just come back. We'll be fine. All right. All right. Just go so, away. so. We just got done talking about a very piece of crap game that's not very appealing. It only has five people enjoy it per day ago. I think there's only three. But let's talk about a game that has a lot of momentum going for it right now, and that's Call of Duty Modern Warfare. So both Rob and Diego have played this game. I have it because I got it when I bought my video card. I have not played it yet because last night it was a uh, – it was not very good and – People couldn't get on. Yeah, it was working version. on PC, right? <laughs> no, yeah. it was not. Servers were down on PS4, but then I just played, played the campaign anyway, so I'm fine. Yeah, yeah servers but before, were down. Before, before, the, before these guys give it that absolutely glowing review that they, they are going to give it, which uh -oh. from what I hear, um, here's a quick plug for the website. If you go to the Outer Heaven YouTube channel, you can see some like really crappy over-the-shoulder footage of me playing on PS4 really badly. Thanks, Pax. How many times <laughs> you get killed? Shitloads. Up. Oh. Get better, nub. I I I, Learn I, to play. I, I, I I died. I died more than I like kill people. You do get shot again, from like a lot that's, of places. That, that, in that's that game, playing. Though. That's playing on a PS4 as well. So, you know, I'm not really much with the first person shooters on consoles. I prefer give me good old PC any day. Yeah, there's that's a thing fair. about keyboard and mouse versus controllers, but I won't get into that podcast because I just won't get into it. 
Go ahead, guys. Glorious PC Master Race, Golden Hell. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start. Um, I am good right in this game. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's great so far. Um, I have only jumped into the campaign just because... I feel like I have a good idea of what the multiplayer is going to be like. I mean, I can't imagine it's vastly different from what the beta was like. Um, so I figured I'd start with the campaign first because that's usually what I used to do when I played Call of Duty a lot when I was younger. I'd be like, all right, do the campaign and then I'll finish the multiplayer. Um, and so I just hopped in today, started it up, and um, and it, it's good. It's it's interesting. It feels it's like very nostalgic reminiscent of Call of Duty 4. Like um, it just feels like, you know, you kind of dropped back in as a soldier. It doesn't feel like everything's like bloated with, you know, like sci-fi, like here's a grunt and here's how you kill good. Like it, it actually feels relatively grounded. Still feels like Call of Duty though. I mean, it's not like this revolutionary war is dangerous, war is scary. You know, um, you should feel something when you play this. I mean, there are some parts that do do that, but it definitely just still feels like a Call of Duty campaign that you would expect from you know any of the other games some of the original games it's very reminiscent of that um so i played about uh, four hours i would say uh the campaign pretty much on the way to finishing it um and uh the thing about this game is that it still looks beautiful i mean we talked about it a little bit when we did the multiplayer beta and everything like that but the game just looks gorgeous it's 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 like a very beautiful game like the the impact of the guns is like it visually like stunning um the sound design is perfect like it, it really feels like you know you're using a weapon inside a crowded building or you're using a weapon in a battlefield like you can hear echoes of gunshots when you shoot a sniper in the desert or when you're inside a building like the shot from a handgun it reverberates around you know the walls and stuff like it, it it's just very well thought out design like it, it it's you know these little details that put into every moment that kind of stick out to you um that you probably wouldn't normally see in like a like a standard shooter or whatever, like um, the the only other game that I think that did that was like Battlefield, where they would put like this echo filter over the sound design when you're inside a place and you shoot a gun compared to outside. Um, so what uh, very difficulty cool. are you playing on? I'm playing on Hardened. Okay, me um, too. Because I just feel like uh, as somebody who's played a bunch of shooters, you know, I, I want to have at least some challenge when I jump into it. Um, so I've been playing it on Hardened, and um, there are some parts of it that I was, like, genuinely challenged. It, it, sometimes you can get overrun, and, you know, the enemies are smart enough to literally overrun you and, like, take you down. Like, you actually have to think about where you're going. A lot of the inside segments in particular can be pretty difficult if you're just kind of expecting to run through, run and gun, and just blow stuff up like you could in any other Call of Duty, like... It just doesn't work. You you can get overrun and you can get, you know, <laughs> run down. Like if you try to just kind of run through guns blazing and do what you want to do, you actually feel like you need to stick to the plan. Like, you know, uh, there's one segment where you're in uh, you're in London and you're you're storming like a like an apartment building, I guess, with all oh, the um, town hall mission. Yeah, yeah, where the like all, all the terrorists are like are in there. It's at night. You have to like storm the building. Um and it's just like this very slow segment where you you clear the first floor of the building. There's like three or four floors and then you pop on your night vision and then everybody just slowly moves up the stairs. It's kind of just like if you ever watched um the movie about the like the Bin Laden takedown, you know, like it's just this very slow. Everybody's in night vision. Everybody's like trying to stay quiet. You're moving up the stairs one step at a time and you're watching the doors like it's just like this very tense moment. Um, and it, and it's 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 interesting because it's it's not like, you know, any other Call of Duty campaign where you pick up a gun, and you run through and there's plenty of that throughout the rest of the campaign. But it's like you actually have to stop, follow your team watch your corners if they something say something's clear then you can move up because you can trust your teammates you know to some extent um and and like you actually have to think about where you're going if you if you just waltz into a room like a dude with a shotgun will kill you and you'll have to restart from the beginning like it that's just how it is so it's, there's actually some thought into you know progressing through the story and you know like certain scenarios and moments of the game where you actually have to think about what you're doing like it feels like a tactical like shooter it's not just you know what people like to associate with call of duty at least you know in the multiplayer aspects and you know as it's seen um but i've been enjoying it a lot it, it's it picks out a few different moments and just kind of like 
really makes you improvise. There was like one moment in particular that I was like, whoa, that that was insane. Like it actually did something that was crazy. I mean, Diego, you might know what I'm talking about, um, but it's the moment with the flashback. There and are a few flashbacks. So th- I think like I know the... which one in particular. Well, there are, okay, two of the flashbacks in particular. I'm going to talk about one that I think was kind of tacky, but I think I know which one you're talking about. The the. F- I'll, I guess I'll just say the one with Farah. That's that's okay. That doesn't really clear anything up. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm assuming the first one with Farah then, because I'm you're the you're twenty not as years far ago as... one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, that one I was just kind of like, oh, whoa, that's that's weird. And so like it literally like they kind of did like this complete like reverse like it, it turned into like a horror game almost or at least they tried to make it like oh, yeah. that like it was it was kind of cool i was like was oh tense. that 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 is very different and i was just like you know like running around this building it was it's kind of like if you ever play a horror game you get spotted by the monster and the monster chases you it, it like creates this moment of tension where like you're playing as this kid and you have to like evade like a full-size soldier like this dude is massive and you have to like you know, run around the little house like you're hiding under like beds and stuff, furniture, trying to like fight back. It, it's it's like this like yeah, you have to David pick up Goliath like moment. you have to look like, for like screwdrivers and knives and stuff to defend yourself with. It's really cool. Yeah, it was it was super cool, and I was like, whoa, like <laughs> I was not expecting this at all. Like you know, any like cutscene in a previous Call of Duty would just be like you walk to this place and then you watch the scene play out, and it's just like these characters existed before the game takes place and and this one it actually feels like oh you like jump dropped into a moment where the like actual growth of the character occurs and you have to play that moment of like tension and and despair and you have to like you know kind of understand where she comes from why she's so intense all the time that it like this is where it comes from it it was just like this really cool moment there's a bunch of like moments spread throughout the campaign that are like that where they just kind of like just for a second takes you out of the typical I can run into a building and shoot my gun real fast and kill everybody. Like it actually stops you for a second and is like, remember there are humans behind the guns that are shooting every once in a while. And you do have to play out these moments and, and, you know, kind of understand where this character is coming from. And that's also another thing that I like a lot about the campaign is that it actually focuses on the characters rather than just kind of like introducing you to them. And then they all, you know, attack one another. That's what I always liked about the first Modern Warfare, where it was like you're introduced to your player character, which is Soap, and then you, you play with like Captain Price. He's like this like charismatic leader, um, and you know you're introduced to Zakai of the 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 uh, the main villain. He's got like all these you know um, intentions of just being pure evil. You know, typical you know Call of Duty campaign. Here's a villain, go get him. Um, but like they actually introduce characters in this game, and you actually focus on, on that a lot. And it's like you know, you play it, your player character actually speaks, and it, it drops in between several different protagonists and stuff. And it, they give you kind of like towards the end, like this whole like squad mechanic, and you're familiar with everybody that you're working with to complete your mission. Like it's it, it, that's what I appreciated a lot about it was just that you know, it's not just like here is a backdrop where you can blow stuff up in it. Like you actually focus on like the characters and stuff and you want to complete the mission because you know, you want to see your, your protagonists and your, your squad mates succeed and stuff. And so that was actually like a nice uh, change of pace from just like the typical, like, you know, just shoot stuff. And I've enjoyed it so far. It's been great. I'm getting a lot of vibes from this. I haven't played it obviously, but it sounds a lot like they looked at more single player games. I'm getting a lot of bad company out of this. Am I wrong? Um, in the way it focuses on story and like presentation. Yeah. Yes. Tonally, no. You could yeah. not be more wrong. <laughs> yeah, tonally, no. But it definitely um brings in a lot of like the the squad mechanic. Like you know, bad company had a lot of just like you know banter with your squad mates. Like you know, different cutscenes and stuff would be like, oh hey, we're gonna steal this truck full of gold bars and you know run off into the distance. You know, like it has like those like character moments in between where you know there's interaction between the fighting and you know they you know they like have conversations about their childhoods or whatever or or you know. Um, and, and they connect with one another and it actually feels like, you know, they're characters who are to some extent, if not friends, just colleagues who actually speak to with one another in between shooting guns at one another, or, well, with each other, not at one another. But yeah. yeah, like the four main playable characters in this game, they all have like history with each other. And it's they, a lot of it you see in flashbacks, but a lot of it like it's just hinted at. You don't necessarily get to, you don't necessarily get to see that. So 
I, I think they have really great chemistry. I really like all four of the playable characters. Because, yeah, you play as all four of them at one point. Yeah. Because, yeah, you have, you have, we don't play as Price. But you have you have Alex, you have Farah, you have Kyle, and then I'm missing one, right? Or no? Is it just the three? Kyle, well, and then there's the brother, but I don't think he ever plays the brother. No, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm including Price. You don't ever play as Price, but yeah. Captain Price steals the show in every scene he's in. He's so cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I've, I've finished the campaign. I, I played through all of it. It took me about six hours. It's not very long, but then again, COD campaigns never are. Um, this is a top three Call of Duty campaign, for sure. Easy. And I, yeah. don't, I don't necessarily want to say it yet, but I think it might be my favorite of all time. It might just be recency bias, but like, I love this campaign. From start to finish, I was on the edge of my seat. I played it in one sitting, which, I mean, it's not very long, so it wasn't hard to, but, but just from the second it opens, like, it yeah they're trying to go for like that no russian moment like with shock value just for shock value's sake but like some of it some of it hits like very it like just, yeah there's stuff that happens there's really early early mission things like the second mission in the game um there's like a bombing in london and you're playing as as this cop right and uh, the military comes in and everything and there are terrorists everywhere and you're having a shootout but the thing is like it's a crowded like plaza so there's civilians everywhere and they're just running all over the place and you're trying you only have your pistol you're like i don't know who to shoot i'm trying not to shoot the wrong people i don't know where oh, i'm getting yeah. shot from i'm just hiding behind a car and if you're playing on a hard difficulty like like harden or veteran you go down in like two shots hmm. so you're just like i'm freaking yeah. out i'm panicking and like man there there's some heavy stuff going on in these cutscenes. they really like in in the in the road, road to launch, they were like, we're gonna we're gonna tackle some pretty heavy subject matter, and they don't shy away from that stuff in this game. Like it's it's there, and for the most part, it's handled pretty well. There's one scene that kind of stood out to me that it was I don't think it was handled the best. Just it kind of almost made me laugh out loud. Um, there are flashbacks in this game, and I think it's the second flashback with Farah. Very light gameplay spoilers here, and very very light story spoilers. There's a waterboarding sequence in this game. All right. Which it's it's a game about modern warfare. They're trying to be greedy, they're trying to be cool and realistic. Of course, it's going to be waterboarding, but there's like a mini game about it, which I thought was kind of in poor taste. Like you're getting waterboarded in first person. It's first person camera. They throw the rag over you. They start pouring the water on you, and then it's the the game tells you move the camera away, try to avoid the water, and which is like <laughs> okay, I guess whatever. But then it says and click L3 when you're free of the water to breathe. It, it, it's just a whole mini game around waterboarding, and I'm like, this isn't. This, did this really have to be? Oh man! I think like we were doing so well, and then there's a waterboarding <laughs> mini game. It's just, it, I almost felt like there should be like Zelda music over it. It was that oh, out boy. of place. It was, <laughs> but like, other than you, that, like, like most of it was pretty good. Yeah, it's as if you like took like that GTA mission where you have to like torture one of the dudes, and you just get to like pick and choose your tools and stuff. Like it's that tacky. Like it feels like it's, it it shouldn't be there. It's Granted, like that, but if, like you're that the guy thing, getting but... tortured. It's like try not to pass out. Yeah, <laughs> win win extra points. It's super. I feel like that that was the only part of the, of the game where I was like, yeah. okay, maybe this didn't work as well as I they thought it would. But like, there are dialogue options in this too. They don't really have that much of an effect. But like, that's just to show how how prevalent the story is. Like, you get to choose what p characters say at some points, and I think that's really cool. Yeah. Also, another thing I wanted to um, talk about because you brought it up is that um, kind of like the ambiguity when you're fighting other like enemy combatants because a lot of the times, especially in that in that first like London mission mission where you know the bombing goes off, everybody's in a panic. Like this game does a really good job at making all like combat scenarios um, just about as difficult as it would be if you were a real soldier. And I mean, to some extent, that might not be true, but like it really hammers home the fact that like in war, it's very difficult to tell who's your ally and who's your enemy. Like a lot of the times, like especially during that London mission, like, you know, the terrorists are wearing black, the cops are wearing black, like some of them might be wearing like a, a bright yellow vest to symbolize that they're some of them know, are regular clothes. They just have a gun. It's really hard to tell them yeah. apart from civilians. Oh yeah, very very true. And like a lot of the time, like even in some of the other missions, like when you're you're fighting with like a rebel group in in a lot of this game as well. And a lot of the time, you'll look around a corner, and if there's two of them, and you don't look at your your ally right away, like the the highlight that will say that it is your ally, like the name or like their their rank or whatever, won't show up right away. So if you look at them and you shoot the wrong person, like you can commit friendly fire. Like it is just a thing that can happen sometimes. Like it, it, it can get to the point where if you, you know, you're not like right on target, like thinking, oh, this could be my enemy or this could be my ally. If you don't make that decision right, like you can kill your ally. Like it, they all are just like designed so to the point where 
they're very similar and it's just you know they're trying to add that in as kind of like an effective hammering home like you know war is war is dangerous war is strange like you know you can never tell who's your ally or enemy like a lot of time you have to be vigilant and so like a lot of that would happen too where i'd like look around a corner and like oh that's an enemy and i like go to like shoot at them and their little name pops up and i'm like oh i'm sorry i <laughs> did not mean to do that but it yeah it, i like that a lot about it too where it's just kind of like you know you have to be like focused this... at all times pretty much oh, yeah. otherwise like you can get easily caught up in the action and not know what's happening yeah and i like that a lot about like the, the ui too it's very minimal so like a lot of the times like um you know your your ui is only going to show up if you do something or you know it's pretty like... much non-existent unless you're like shooting in that case it just shows like your ammo yeah, and if you're going to open a door, you have to look at that door and open it. Like, you, granted, you could sprint through some of them, but, like, you know. That's a bad idea, especially, like, that, that town hall mission, which I really want to talk about again. Like, it, there are only maybe four or five people you kill in that mission, but it feels like you go through a lot more because, like, it's so cramped, it's dark, your your squad barely fits on the staircase, like, you have to have your night vision goggles on, and, like, you can hear the people, like, the terrorists in these little apartments, like, talking to each other, like, there's people outside, what do we do? Like, there's women and children. There's a baby in one of the rooms. Like, you really have to check your fire. But, like, you can hear them. Like, go high. I'll, I'll wait here. And you have to, like, slowly... Whenever you press square to open a door, it doesn't fully open it. It just cracks it open. And you have to, like, slowly inch forward to open it. But, like, you kind of, like, use your gun to aim. Like, use the door for cover almost. But, like, you have to... It's really reflex-based. Because, like, if those those guys get the drop on you from that, that close of a range, you're going to die in, like, one shot. Yeah. So you have to... But, like, sometimes, like, you'll shoot the guys. And, like, they'll fall to the ground, but they won't be dead. Like, they'll, they'll like pull out a pistol and shoot you or like they'll crawl away like it's especially in like that kind of setting that you don't normally get in a first person shooter like it's just a bedroom like a, just a domestic bedroom yeah. and they're wearing regular clothes it's like a little unsettling and plus like the women and children are just there like yeah the, on the like once the baby starts crying like you're just you leave it there like it's just a baby what are you gonna do with it um but like you start clearing other rooms and like you're just it's really quiet there's no music it's just you know there's somebody in the other room it's really tense yeah. You're going to shoot him. He's going to shoot you. The baby won't shut up. Like you're just in a town home. And it's a lot of missions in this game. Don't take place on traditional battlefields. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's something I liked a lot too. I remember there's like a very specific, like there's this one cheeky enemy who's in a bathroom. And if you look like at the door the wrong way, yep. He yeah, will he'll immediately blast through it. He'll blast through it if he hears you. you. Yep. Yeah, it's, yeah. And you have to start from the beginning. Yeah. I think that's really cool. Um, so I think what you guys are saying, this is a really good game. Yeah. But before, one thing I want to touch on before we wrap this up is it's not only, I think, one of the best stories Cod has ever told, but the campaign missions remind me a lot, Keith, this is a game I know you like, of Titanfall 2. Mm -hmm. Because I think it, every mission is, it's not just going down a hallway and shooting people. Every mission has, like, a gimmick. Like, it's, this is probably, this game is some of the most varied gameplay I've ever seen in the first-person shooter. Yeah. Like, there's a mission later on that I don't think you've gotten to yet, Rob. It's, like, the, one of the last missions. It's pretty much just Splinter Cell. It's a really, really open-ended level where there, you get three objectives on a map and prices, like, go clear all these places. But like you can shoot out lights and your night vision goggles have a light meter and like you're pretty much invisible if you're not in the in and the there's some of that dark. in the beginning too um, yeah but like the it, goes, it goes really and, yeah. intense yeah the helicopters little rc planes in one of them there's yeah. a really early mission where you have to like blend in with people on the work line so you have to conceal your weapon and like pick up a cinder block to pretend like you're a worker but you can also use it as a melee weapon like yeah. a lot of really cool stuff that's not just i'm a soldier and i'm shooting the bad guys like there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff like that where you're in plain clothes you're undercover there's like a chase sequence through like an alley at one point a lot of really cool stuff. A lot of really varied story and gameplay stuff in this game. Yeah. If there's ever a campaign for Call of Duty that you should check out, you should certainly check out this one. It's definitely so not good. worth skipping at all. It's yeah. so good. Do not skip it if you have this game. Yep. Well, I got to beat the Outer Worlds first before I play this. I made a promise, so. But I it definitely tell you guys are really um, in glamour with this game, so I definitely will give it a, ch a chance once I'm finished that. Yeah, multiplayer is good too, but man, that campaign. I'm only really playing for campaign. I don't care about the multiplayer. I usually stick yeah. away from multiplayer for That's a while fair. anyway. Also, I do want to point out, if you are playing on PC, there is a bit of a uh, a thing that I did experience early on. There's like a weird issue with cutscenes. Sometimes they lag a little bit, at least in the beginning they do. It's PC specific, I think, though. Yeah. Because a lot of the consoles weren't having that issue at all. Yeah, but I've seen uh, people complain about that. Yeah. So I did experience a little bit of that. Um, so just keep that in mind. But other than that, there's been no other issues. All right. Well... Issues. Hey, Carl, you still awake there? I'm still here, and speaking of the other worlds, I'm currently uh, getting that th thanks to the good people at Xbox Game Pass. Yeah, we talk about that enough. We're not going to do it today. We're talking about bad shit again. Uh, there's a game you really want to talk about that's really bad, 
some wrestling game. What is that game again? Oh boy, WWE 2K20. Uh, like people say that Bethesda games come out come out being <laughs> glitchy and all sorts of fucked up. Um, yeah, well, 2K have decided they've they're gonna say they hold my beer and uh, top just about anything that I've seen Bethesda do. Uh, the game has released in like absolute shambles. Like, there's so many glitches, I don't even know where to begin. The physics engine is broken. The graphics engines are broken. The uh, creator wrestler is broken. Image uploading doesn't work. Uh, Games will crash on anything from a standard one-on-one match to trying to do universe mode or the new story mode. Uh... God, what else is it? Like, just about everything is absolutely broken about that game, which really saddens me as a wrestling fan because I usually go out, I'll get the uh, deluxe or um, collector's editions of these each year, regardless if 2K sends me a copy of the review or not. And this year was the first year I have actively turned around and said, I'm not buying it. I went and I cancelled my pre-order the other day to get the, the money back on it because the game is in such a destroyed state. And to be honest, and it also took them nearly a week to put out a statement saying, we're going to get this fixed. And even <laughs> then, it's like, huh, you might have to wait a month or more for the corrective patch. So, yikes. It's like, hey, quality assurance. We don't test our stuff before we send it out. Well, didn't they switch developers this year, like on a really, really short notice or something. I like wouldn't that? say they yeah, switch developers. Uh, the, the developer that they've used for the actual game engine and control engine and everything else, uh, Ukes Creative, they bounced. They they bounced. They were they like, said, "We're done. We've had, a, we've had enough. We're going to walk off somewhere." I reckon that they're um, quite possibly working on other deals with other companies that have recently popped up in the wrestling circles. Uh, maybe AEW might be having something in the works, who knows? But, um, yeah, it seems like one of those things of, like, they should have skipped this year. Like, it's that bad. Character models look worse than last year, which is stupid because all the uh, the graphical capture stuff, like the, the models and everything, is 2K in-house. 2K have their own dedicated capture software and like little portable theater thing that they take around to the wrestling shows and scan the, the characters' bodies. This year, it just looks like they just didn't do it. I've seen some of those models, and they are. This atrocious. looks like an early PS3 game. This is bad. Oh now, no, no, people have been people have been comparing it to the PS2 days. That's how bad it gets. Now, I wanted to bring up real quick because you mentioned Ukes. Now, I'm not sure if a lot of people know who Ukes are, but they have been involved with wrestling games for decades. Yukes originally got involved with the wrestling stuff back with the Nintendo 64 game. No Mercy. No Mercy and, and WrestleMania 2000 on the 64. And then they started working their engine into a lot of PS2 stuff exclusively in Japan. Uh, but they've always been a part of the WWE license. Yep. It's like if you, you get the WWE license for video games, you work with Yukes because they have the the uh all the the graph uh sorry all the the gameplay engines and everything else for them to bounce on 2k and 2k have to pull everything out of their butt at the last minute again it comes down to you know what what was the better option at the time you know so a who, lot of people are saying this, this is 2k internal this is just uk uh 2k completely remember i i uh while back earlier this year, I believe Ukes had mentioned that they were leaving to start their own a game to compete against a WWE game. So that could be a big reason why they left. A big reason. But either way, I, I think I really think 2K should have just looked at this game like, you know what, we need to delay it. Off here. Yeah, we need to delay this. This is bad. I mean, as much crap as people give EA, when they saw the NBA Live for those years was not doing good, it was like, you know what? This game's not coming out. Yeah, especially because, like, you lose your developer last minute like that. You you already have your in-house guys making NBA 2K. And do they make any other games besides that? 
They have that uh, another one, I think, right? Make, no, making, none of them. no, but they do do a lot of publishing. Yeah, but like they they develop two K and NBA two K in house anyway, right? Yeah, no, nope. I believe NBA, so. So NBA like, 2K yeah, two K is all in house. Yes, yeah, so they're gonna split development on that. I mean, of course, NBA is gonna take priority, but like, just just take the off year for WWE. I don't understand why they would release it at this state for sixty dollars. It just makes no sense to me. If anything, this does more damage to the brand than the money they're gonna make off of sales. Pretty much, yeah. and yeah. Consider, considering that the backlash on this has been so bad that I know I can uh, c can confirm that Sony is giving refunds for the digital copies. Wow, they really? They never give refunds. That's, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. So, Sony, Sony are openly giving refunds. Oof. Um, this game was a 40 on Metacritic. Yikes. Yeah, uh, it got 2 out of 10 on IG. Uh, two, out of, 2 stars out of 5 on IGN. The Metacritic score is just absolutely terrible. I have yet to find a reviewer that actually says anything positive about this. And that includes all the guys that are like um, Tony the Pizza Guy on YouTube. He's one of the big supporters. He usually gets a lot of the pre-content. Like he gets previews months and months in advance and everything else. Even he said, stay away from this. Like guys, <laughs> that de dedicated YouTubers and streamers. I'm watching WWE some videos of it. <laughs> have turned, have turned yeah. around. This is stay, terrible. Stay away. Like um, NL Gaming, who does nothing but wrestling games, they're playing it for a little bit, but even they're sitting there going, "I'd rather be playing 2K19 again." Like that's how <laughs> that bad wasn't it. really that good. Yeah, well, 2K19 wasn't but like it's not the best game, but. It's like functional. Yeah, it I love works. this video where the guy's bouncing across all the ropes. What? <laughs> what? I'll wait till you see some of the creator wrestler stuff, man. Oh my god. Oh man. This is atrocious. Yeah. The thing that's bonkers to me is how do you get like the, the wrestling ropes wrong? Like, how do you make those teleport across the stage? Like, those are mostly fixed. Like, how do those break out of the environment? That, like, I just don't even. Uh, uh... The ropes have always been an issue in wrestling games because it's all collision detection. And, like, you can't really predict the way a rope is going Ooh. to bounce based on the collision. What the hell so, is that with this ref? But some of these, <laughs> like, some of these are just really bad, like the ref. And uh, there are, like, somewhere they'll hover, like, two, three feet above the ring or something like that. But they'll squat down and, and walk. <laughs> like, like like a little squat walk thing. Oh yeah, I've seen a few wrestlers lose oh. their kneecaps into the ground. Yeah, it's it's bad. <laughs> what about these graphics? Why does the Rock look worse this year than he did last year? What? Yeah, this is bad. I like I don't know. Like they have no reason for the game to look terrible. Like gameplay wise, to be terrible. Okay, that was Ukes. Okay, we can we can definitely straight up say that. But the fact is. The visual stuff. They have that bad still, right? It is. Like that's in house. That's all, still that's have all the models. in house. Just use last yeah, year's stuff. That's all in house. Holy Man. shit. This is bad. Yeah, guys. I'm I'm gonna take a page from game ranks. Not that I care about them. Before you buy this game, don't. Yeah, not even before. Just don't. <laughs> don't just don't buy it. Don't buy this do game. Your, do do your research and to be honest, if you're gonna buy it, wait until they do like a, a complete edition re release. Probably sometime after Christmas, but before March. That might be the time because the hopefully they will have patches year. and fix this shit. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> yeah, this game is wow. Oh no, it's really bad. You hate to see it. <laughs> this is wow. Here, I'm gonna send you guys a. Just watch that at that segment. This wow. Okay. I really wish we were using a video podcast or so you could see this. Oh, this, this would have been a great opportunity for that. Look oh, at that. wow. Why are the ropes going on? <laughs> why, They're what, vibrating. why are they flying in the air? What? Yeah, this is terrible. <laughs> what oh, is yeah, happening? Saw... <laughs> <laughs> don't buy wow. this game. Yeah, don't buy that game. Please. Damn. Buy literally Damn. anything else. Well, not Fallout 76. Well, honestly, at this point, I don't know. <laughs> That game's not sixty dollars. Yeah, yeah. When, when when you said earlier, you know, Fallout seventy six is bad. I I'm sitting here smirking, going, "Oh, I know something that's worse." <laughs> okay, you win. Holy crap, you win. You know what would have helped this game? Delay. A delay. You know what else was delayed? All oh, these segues, Keith. These great games. I'm doing. I'm getting better at this, aren't I? Ooh. Ooh. All these yeah, good games. So let's count the games that have been delayed 
from 2019 to 2020 and 2020 and beyond. So we talked about Doom Eternal moving to next year. Rip. We now have the loss of, well, The Last of Us 2 now, or Last of Us Part 2 has been delayed until May. Yeah. Watch Dogs Legion has no release date now. They push it to the next fiscal year, so that pushes it at least one month uh, ahead of what it was. Oh, jeez. Because it was due out in March. Their fiscal year starts in April. And they, because they want to polish the game. Uh, I'm pretty sure and there then, was something um, else. There was Rainbow, a couple I, of... I believe they delayed Rainbow Six Quarantine as well into the next yeah. fiscal year. Mm-hmm. Because, man, that game is supposed to come out like in January or February, and I haven't even seen anything after, about it after E3. And that and was I'm, only a short teaser E3, so I don't know I don't, where that game yeah. I'm teasing people saying Final Fantasy is going to get delayed, and they're getting mad at That's me. That's not happening. No. They give me those they looks like, don't you dare. No. <laughs> they, they, were, they were playing 4D chess. They got everybody else a delay except for them, all right? I don't know, because The Last of Us Part 2 was like, we yeah, got this. They it's just announced out. their date like two weeks ago, like February. It's Plus, happening. The press got to play has, it. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, Remake has had a lot of gameplay demos. Like, this this better be The Last of Us 2 press got like six hours of hands-on. Yeah, they played, so like, a lot of that game. And, and now like delayed February pre. I pre ordered my collector's edition. Now I'm not getting it until May. Yeah, but I mean, like remake had like public demos. Like this game better be coming out. Like fans. Oh yeah, remake's been game. played at like trade yeah. shows for like a year at this point. <laughs> yeah, remake's happening. Mm. Uh, it's just so annoying because I literally was I wrote a piece of published today that was just like a list of the games that you should be checking out and like. Last of Us Two was a big one on that list, and I was gonna put it up there because it's like you know it's coming out right in between everything. Yeah, remember like and... two weeks ago, we were like, man, February is so packed. Like this spring, all these games are gonna compete with each other, and it still is for it, sure. It's still just is. Oh, yeah. Still is. now. Yeah. yeah, all of pretty much all of Ubisoft spring presence is gone. They delayed yeah. that. Yeah, Ubisoft, their investors cannot be happy. Rainbow Six, they would have Watch Dogs, they would have Gods and Gods and Monsters within like a month of each other, and those those are all gone now. Last Gods of Us is out of the picture. I don't think Gods and Monsters got a delay, did it? No, it did. It oh, did. It, did. it was pretty much all their all their uh, spring titles for the next fiscal year, so they could be anytime in late twenty twenty or even early twenty twenty one. All right, gonna have to update that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now all we have is like Cyberpunk remake, Doom, all Final Fantasy, Doom, Animal Crossing. <laughs> I mean, compared to like what it was before, we lost yeah. about yeah, almost no, half yeah. of the of the spring <laughs> releases. Which good is news fine. with like, that spread though. Them out, please. There's good news. At least you know Capcom came out and said, "Hey, Monster Hunter World for the PC is coming out in July or in January, January." January. We confirmed it. We we reaffirmed it. It's coming it's out. out yeah, you know, some of us have like been done with that game for a long time already. Shut up and have reviewed it. <laughs> you can go read that on the OutOfHeaven.net if you're. I interested. want to play it so bad. While you're waiting, PC players, just go read my review. You know. Uh, but you know what? It'll be worth it because 4K. Enhanced resolutions, they are enhanced textures, uncapped frame rate. Monsters too. No, they show one of the monsters that was in the uh, the first ex- the first DLC. What do you want to call it? Release. All they added was just the one. Yeah. Well, it's better than nothing. Hopefully, it means it'll be there at launch. Because I don't know. I, I feel like they've 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 promised a lot of things for Monster Hunter players on PC, and they have under delivered. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. See, here's the thing. Why would you put that in the trailer on the the the, the PC trailer if it was not going to be in the game? Because it was in they like Iceborne uh, pre-launch stuff for console. Because they Don't were like, this is going to be our first content update. It's going to come like two weeks after launch. Don't do that. It better be the same day. Don't do that. Nah, Bring it, us up to like speed. Later in January. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a big expansion. You'll be fine. There's too many games coming out. There are way too many games coming out. I won't have enough I'm, freaking I'm glad time. These games got delayed. I'm going to say it. I'm glad they're pushed back <laughs> because I my schedule was looking yeah. really rough. I mean, I was going to play them anyway. I, I will make the time. I'd just rather not. You'd rather not. Let me pull up the release schedule, actually, because I want to see oh, yeah. what we got now. Oh, there's still there's still plenty there's of games still coming. A lot. There's, there's absolutely a got... very handy article that you can check out on theoutofhaven.net. Oh, right is now there? That... <laughs> there is. Um, well, is, that, that, is, that, is that accurately updated? Because you know, I feel like there were some delays that happened since then. <laughs> Other than gods and monsters, everything else should be accurate. They didn't put. Did they put out a major announcement that included gods and monsters? Because I saw a Legion. It was just like, hey, we're delayed. They did like, put hey, out with all of our games. All right, well, <laughs> I will have to update that, but everything else should be accurate. Um, oh, and their and their stock plummet twenty percent when they did that. Oof. It happens. Yeah, that'll do it. Yeah, but in January you got Monster Hunter World Iceborne on PC. You got a uh, Yakuza Seven. You have well, that's really it. February though, we have Ori still. We have. Persona 5 Scramble. I'm excited for that. that have you guys seen that's, the only, for that? that's only in Japan, though. 
Oh yeah, that is just Japan. Yeah, we don't have a release date over here. Yeah. Royal's coming out in the spring sometime though. No day for that. I haven't even beat the first one or the the base game. You probably do that. The game's good. It was way too long. I was like, this is too long. Yeah, the game's like a hundred hours. Is it sad that I'm looking at like next couple of months? I'm looking at like Death Stranding, Jedi Fallen Order. To no, it's not. Just, no, it's totally not. Three. Like I I'm can... looking at like, nearly a game a week this in upcoming in November, but at the same time, a lot of them I'm like, I need to sit back and wait for reviews first. I will tell you this. I can't, tr- I can't. I can't trust the quality of those games. At this point. I trust in respawn, and the st- the limited stuff that people have been saying about Death Stranding has been good. Dude, they the said otter they, hat. They literally <laughs> cannot talk about it, but it's everybody who's talked about it says it is great. Do not worry, and respawn. I trust. I, I so, just think that trailer of, of Norman Reedus swimming in the river like an otter is all you have to show to anybody to sell them on Death Stranding. So I have no problems with those two games, and if if Star Wars, oh God, here we go again. Star Wars Jedi, Jedi Fallen, Fallen Order, Order strikes Wars back. Name. There's a couple uh, commas and colons that need to be there. Yeah, you know when that game comes out, I can see myself doing multiple playthroughs. The thing is, Pokemon's on the same day, and I still don't know which one I'm going to play first. I already canceled my pre-order Pokemon. I don't care. The more and more wow. I read about, the you more and so more I'm excited. Dang. You were like, "Oh, it's going to be my first one." They and keep changing are. stuff and keep going back, and it's like, "God, this is what? What are you doing? What have they changed?" It's it's Pokemon. It's the same. Nothing shit changed. You've been dealing with since 1990, fucking six. Give me all of the Pokemon. Stop saying we're going. Well, these aren't going to be here. I'm not. That's no, that's not that big a deal. We're not going to get into the national decks discussion on this show because some people feel <laughs> really passionately yeah. about that subject. But you know what? Digimon over Pokemon. Let's go. Those oh. Digimon games are very good, from what I've heard too. I, I want to play those. So the there's that. ones. Yeah, they're very good. They're one of this out. You definitely play them. The new yeah, one came out. Them out. All right, so we're at the point of the podcast where Mace needs to clear his throat and tell us all about PAX Australia 2019. So Mace, yeah, let's go. I'll try, and, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible because most of the stuff that I've done you can check out on the Outer Haven YouTube channel at this point in time, such as the uh, interviews I did for uh, games like Speaking Simulator 2, which I thought was just absolutely fucking hilarious and it's a lot harder than you realize. Um, I've also got uh, where I sit down with the one of the higher-ups from Alienware talk about the aurora 9 system that they got coming out plus all the uh, you know what i just want you to talk about that beautiful oled screen tell me about the oled screen that's all i want to know just tell me about i saw the oled screen did you touch it did you touch it touch it it was behind glass Ah. (laughs) it was behind glass but i but i got i got to have a look at it and good hard close-up look at it oh it's beautiful in case you cry i i am crying i've seen pictures and i'm like wow it's like $5,000. It, 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 it is so goddamn vibrant, clear for, like, gaming. Like, you know how you walk into some TV stores and you see, like, the 4K with the HDR and everything else running all at once? And you, and you stop and you go, mm. I want this. And you just sort of sit there for hours looking at, like, the, the individual black lines on something. Yeah, this is one of those ones where you sit there and you just go, oh, that is so pretty. I used to do that so much. Ugh. But, like, yeah, I, I I, I wish, I wish, I wish I had that fish. Um, who knows, maybe the nice people at Alienware who have said that they're going to be sending me a lot of stuff over the next 12 months might be able to send me one of those to sit there and play with, with in which case I'd just be like, ah. Um, you got to get a YouTube channel and get 100,000 people because, you know. YouTubers get all the good hey, shit. They, they, no, they love us for what we are, mate. They, they don't worry about our YouTube stuff or anything like that. They are very happy with us as a website. One of the few companies that still work with websites. So tell me about um, Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk, oh, that was interesting. Interesting because just before I got to sit down with uh, with John, who's one of the developers from CD Projekt Red, I actually got to sit through a one-hour presentation. Now, from what I could see, and this was just like unfortunately, I didn't get there was no hands-on demo or anything this year. Oh, it was all it was all video or somebody playing the live demo or something. If you like the way um, the Deus, the recent Deus Ex games 
sort of have that open narrative structure and the way you choose and the way you play the game affects how things go, you're going to love the shit out of this. It's it's like Deus Ex on steroids. Um, like you can, you can play stealthy if you want. You can go in guns blazing, but depending on your actions depends on how the AI will react to you. Like some of the bigger ones will take a lot more uh, strategic placements, like your boss fights and stuff like that. If you go stealthy, you can kill them in like one or two shots you go in guns blazing they're going to come at you like a mac truck so those type of things are definitely what they're looking at here uh you do get like vehicles that you can drive around in as well very big akira anime uh references in this like one of the bikes is literally takeda's red bike from the akira movie for those who, who watched the anime back in the day uh I, I do try to get into a bit of uh, talk with John with the, the interview. Uh, but we we try to talk a bit of like behind the scenes, like development bits and pieces. I did try to get a spoiler out of him, but for some reason the video glitched out. Um, so yeah, you, you can sort of see as much as I can. Uh other things I did get a chance to do, I got to sit down with uh, Victoria Dolbum, who is the uh, one of the design directors for Destiny 2. And we got to talk a lot of uh, Shadowkeep and, and stuff beyond. I actually do get some little bits of information, hints and everything else as to what's coming up next. But uh, again, that's mo we mostly go like development designs type stuff. Uh, what else do I do? I got my hands on Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which, uh, you know, I absolutely failed at. And, yeah, like, unfortunately, like, a lot of the stuff that I did, you're going to see on those YouTube videos which you can find over the Outer Haven YouTube channel. I couldn't really get in on a lot of stuff I wanted to get in on, which was stuff like the Avengers and uh, the Final Fantasy VII demo, because they were just packed. Um, even something like Overwatch on the Switch, packed. I could not, no matter who I knew, who I talked to, I couldn't get into a lot of stuff that I really wanted to do in advance this year. Uh, that sort of soured me a bit because I was in contact with Sony before the event, and unfortunately they just didn't get back to me in time with anything, like to get in and do stuff, so... I'm very thankful to the guys at Alienware, the guys at Bandai Namco for hooking me up with the Cyberpunk interview and everything else, uh, the guys at NVIDIA taking care of me as always, uh, Devolver Digital, and yeah, even the guys at Activision for allowing me to play Call of Duty. Uh, I did spend a lot of time also in the board game and card game area. I went and bought my first set of D&D gaming dice, so I'm now officially big time nerd. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Your first? My first, which turned I'm in into disbelief. three separate sets. I'm in disbelief. I would have thought you would have had some once upon a time I, ago. I had. I have never owned D&D dice sets, which is like the seven dice that range anywhere from uh, three siders upwards to the 20. I have never owned any sets of those at all. I ended up going uh, to Random Encounter Dice, who had a, a booth there. I saw a nice uh, red and white blood pattern set. I bought that. I ended up going back later. They did a nice little charity thing where they were raising uh, half of a, a $10 donation went to uh, Beyond Blue, which is a depression and suicide uh, cause here in Australia. And you basically rolled a D20 and whatever you want off a prize list. So I ended up winning two more sets of dice. Huh. So All I, right. I, did that, I did that twice because, you know, it, it's, it's a charity thing. I, I like giving the charities. Uh, but, yeah, I also got to see my guys down at um, Bushy Road Card Games who were doing Card Fight Vanguard. And they actually gave me two two free uh, starter decks to get back into the game. And, yeah. 
uh, went around, marveled at the the uh, the history of consoles that they have there, like some of the old stuff. They actually had stuff like the development kits for the Nintendo 64 and uh, Dreamcast, like the old the actual dev kit units, not the actual production models. So it was amazing to see some of that stuff this year. Uh, overall, look, PAX is a good show, but I think uh, at least as a, from a media perspective, it's getting a lot harder to do stuff. But yeah, I try, and the results, as you can see, they come back to the site. I think what's happening now is PAX Australia and PAX in general are just becoming more popular. Like PAX East just had its tickets go on sale yesterday, and I know Saturday is completely sold out. I think Friday may have sold out today. I'm, I'm looking at it right now because I just bought tickets for my family. So Friday's low, Saturday's completely sold out. But yeah, PAX is definitely getting a lot more popular. Repop has been putting a lot of effort into getting the show uh, out there. That said, you've been going to PAX Australia for the last three years now? Uh, what? This was actually year seven. Oh, wow. How many... Um, so which one has been your favorite so far, or has it progressed and gotten better over the years? Or is it stagnated? No, in a way, yes, it has stagnated because it's the same people show up each year. But at the same time, they're always bringing something different. Uh, I'd say probably my favorite year was their second, when they moved to the Melbourne Exhibition Center, where they had a lot larger space. And the fact that we started getting the bigger brands like Sony... And Microsoft actually showing up to uh, to PAX Australia as opposed to the EB Games Expo, which they EB Games tried to run for a couple of years and then went screw it, we're going to work with PAX. <laughs> so uh, yeah, probably the second year was probably one of, the, one of my better ones. But just in case my fiance listens to, to this one, it was one year ago where asked to marry me in front of the Bethesda booth. Are oh, you just trying not to get your ass beat? Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> you know what that's like, Keith. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do. All right, well, I'm glad you enjoyed the show. I'm, I'm looking forward to PAX East next year. And Diego is going to PAX South? Yep, PAX South in January, my first so, PAX. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're becoming a lot more popular, so, yeah. Rob, where are you located at again? I am East Coast. Where? East Coast. So, like... Yeah, uh, where? <laughs> like, near Boston. Well, you're going to PAX East then, right? Uh, no, I can't afford it. You, Rob. I can't afford it. What do you mean you can't afford it? I can't afford it. Media passes. You can't afford what? To go to PAX? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get that. We'll get that covered. If that's the problem, that we get that covered. Yeah. Then you'll go to PAX, right? Because I'm coming up there. Yeah, I would go. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. We got that then. We're going. Here we go. There we go. I guess we're going to PAX. We're all going to PAX. There we go. All right. So we've reached the end of the podcast. Um, as always, we usually have something that we forgot or something that just crosses our mind the last second. Is there anything that you guys forgot about? Um, any parting words of wisdom other than don't buy WWE 2K20? <laughs> I can't believe Ghost Recon Breakpoint was so bad. Ubisoft delayed three video games. Wow. You... Okay. They said it on the call, not me. That's just straight up facts. That game is awful. And they delayed games because of it. Because yeah. our game sucked. We're going to make sure these other games don't suck because as they bad. Because they were going to borrow elements from Breakpoint that people didn't like. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, you know, Breakpoint and that whole Ubisoft pass. That game is that's, so bad. That's also bad. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for checking out Spectator Mode Podcast 37. As always, you can find us on audioboom.com, Spotify.com, Google Play, I, Apple iTunes, what is it called now? Apple, Apple Podcast. Podcast. They changed it now. And as well as the Nintendo Entertainment Podcast, you can also find those and those fine outlets just like you can find Spectator Mode. Give us a try. We also have a survey on the Outer Havens Twitter. We'll also put it with this podcast so you guys can gauge how the podcast is doing because without you, there is no us. You can help us grow. That said, thanks for listening. I was about to say thanks for watching. Next week, you may see us in video format. So watch for that. So for Rob, Mace, Diego and myself, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you guys later. See ya.